Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I mean, come on. Isn't that just lovely? I, mean, just, I know that's a familiar scripture, and we've trotted it out every other Sunday, but it's like the creator of the universe came in the form of a man called Jesus. He came and revealed himself to us. And these are some of the words he spoke to us. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, this is the only time that Jesus says what his heart is like. What's the heart of God like? It's the only time. He says, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Massive. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And then Paul comes along and he just jumps in the ring and swinging, <laughs> challenging the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childhood behind me, put the ways of childhood behind me. Um, we've been talking the last couple of weeks about what, it, what does it mean for us to be a disciple of Jesus? Uh, that, that's a massive question, something we all have to wrestle with, because Jesus didn't ask us to believe in him, he asked us to follow him. In fact, he said the demons believe in him. <laughs> so it's not like a high bar to believe in Jesus. It's the following's the tricky thing. The following's a whole other thing. Uh, and so often I think in my Christian journey, I thought that maybe believing in Jesus is enough. I want to believe in him and go to heaven when I die. That'd be cool. Um, but what does it mean to, um, to actually uh, be a disciple of Jesus? And it turns out when you devote yourself to discipleship, you just start discovering the life that Jesus promised you could have in him, the life of the kingdom. So I'm so fired up about what it looks like to create a discipleship culture and share on a discipleship culture in our church. And I love the journey that we're on. And we're going to continue that today. Now, I'm aware that some people haven't been to church this year yet. So... Uh, that's super annoying because the last couple of Sundays have kind of led to this moment. Um, so I've asked John Mark to shoot a video for us. Just No, I'm joking. I just grabbed this off the internet, uh, and, and some of you may have seen this on our page. You know, But here's John Mark summarizing in one minute what I've been trying to say for hours in the last couple of weeks. His primary invitation was, come and follow me. And it was to apprentice under him into this whole new way of life that he called the kingdom of God. And he used both these words, practice and way, all over. I mean, I think in the Gospels, it's like well over 50 times. Jesus uses this word. In Greek, it's hodos. Mm -hmm. And it can be true. It means road or path or way. And it's a word picture in the same way that there's like a road that you follow to get from Jerusalem to Jericho. There is a way of life that you follow in order to apprentice under Jesus into what he called the kingdom of God, the rule, the reign of God, the peace, the presence of God. And this way of life takes practice. So, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, which for hundreds of years has been disputed, like, is this really like even a possible way of life for mm -hmm. an ordinary person? What a lot of people miss is that Jesus bookends the Sermon on the Mount, the very beginning and the very end, he makes a very strong statement about practice. And uh, he just assumes this way of living is going to take a lifetime of practice in community, hence the name Practicing the Way. So, so that, um, that's just the, the last couple of weeks' sermons. And for those that didn't come the last couple of sermons, like, yeah, that was sweet, dodged, dodged bullets all around and then just got the summary and that was cool. Yeah, all good. Okay, so God bless you, really annoyed, there. whatever. Um, but, I love, but, but every time John Mark kind of gets on his riff around the stuff, there's something in me that gets very stirred. It's like, oh, yes, this is, like, this is it. Like, this is what I've been now, I just want to make sure that we're really clear that what we're not talking about is like workspace Christianity. You know, like learn to have your devotions and Sabbath and fast every now and then and give to the church and serve, and then God likes you, right? It's just like we're not talking about that in the slightest. This is the amazing reality. This is why we've got to take communion every week. Like the grace of God's actually scandalous. It's actually scandalous that you can come as messed up as you want to be, and you can come, and if you choose to come to Him, He will embrace you. He will pour out His mercy and His grace and his forgiveness, and he will surround you with his love and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and all you have to do is come to him. It's scandalous. It's, if you actually get your head into it, it's utterly scandalous that God could just do that. 
That the Bible says he's rich in mercy. Isn't that amazing? He's not, he's a, he's not stingy, he's rich in mercy. So, but, but that's what the theologians call justification, right? So we come to the cross and it's like, and, and he pronounces us as, uh, as clean and as his children and it's just the free gift of his grace. And then there's this uh, theological term called sanctification, and this is where, and Paul articulates it brilliantly in Philippians 3.16, which is helpful, to, easy to remember because of John 3.16. So it's one of the few scriptures I can just, Philippians 3.16. So now let us live up to what we have already attained. Interesting use of language here, and I've preached on this before, but I'm trying to get this in your, in your psyche. So now let us live up to what we have already attained. That, another way of saying that is this, let's become who we already are. Does that make sense? So let's like, you've been declared holy and righteous, now be sanctified to become who you already are in Jesus Christ, hallelujah. So that's the process of sanctification. And that's where uh, discipleship's key, like to experience a, a, a soul and a heart and a mind filled with love, joy and peace comes from learning to sit in the presence of God. And when you've got a weapon of mass distraction in your phone... I should always warn your dad jokes incoming. But, you know, when you've got that, it's like when we, we have a billion, sorry, sorry, trillion dollar, print, trillion dollar principality and power trying to distract you, it's hard to abide and remain in Jesus. So you've got to practice, you've got to learn the way of Jesus. So how can we go into those deeper places? How can we, uh, how can we, can we just orientate our life around him? Now, up front, Jesus said, like, to do this isn't cheap, it's costly. Following the way of Jesus is not easy, particularly in this day and age. It requires a radical commitment to live a different sort of lifestyle. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you in so many ways. It's going to cost you money because the more you hang out with him, the more you want to give your money away in radical generosity and discover that's the best way to use it. It's going to cost you Time It could cost you your reputation because you're going to start having a heart for the mar- marginalized in your workplaces and in your schools. It's going to cost you. In so many ways, it's going to cost you because ultimately Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to lay your life down, baby. You've got to pick up your cross and follow me. Now, the story doesn't end on Friday. It ends on Sunday with new life bursting into your world. If you lose your life, you start finding your life in Jesus. Hallelujah. But don't get me wrong. It is costly. It costs, it's a radical commitment. But hear me very, very clearly, there is a cost to not following Jesus as well. And and without a doubt, I would argue that that wide road, which is just the the default road that we are just walking down in our culture, is an easy one to go down, but it leads to all sorts of pain and heartache. It it is costly. And the, the lie of the enemy is simply this. It doesn't actually cost you too much in the short term. It's quite pleasurable in the short term, that wide and easy road. But it's in the long term that things start biting and you start getting addicted and your heart goes through the blender over and over and again and you get lonely and depressed and, dep- and anxious and blah, blah, and all those things, right? Hey. So you got to suss out. Like it's, Both options are costly. You've got to work out which one. But I'm just telling you, that narrow road that Jesus invites us to walk down is the road that leads to life. And so what I want to explore this morning is like, what does it look like to not just be inspired, but actually to live this out? Because I don't want us to have a vision as a church. I want us to live a vision as a church. So we've been talking the last couple of Sundays about a radical devotion to Jesus. I'm tired. I've been in church for 42 years. I was born into this thing. I've been in church longer than most of you. I'm so bored bored with nebulous Christianity that doesn't demand everything of me and it's all, inf- it's all inspiring. It's all this. I want pragmatic following Jesus, get my teeth sunk into it, a radical, I want my life to look and feel different. That's what I'm interested in. I'm so bored with the rest of it. I want his way because it leads to life. And so um, uh, I'm going to, Karen, hold fire actually. We are going to hand out this in a minute, but I've gone, I've gone on a rant, so we're going to go follow, chase this rabbit. Okay, so how do we, so the question then is like, how do we become like Jesus? Like I've talked a whole lot about be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what he did. So like, what does it look like to actually really like see your life changed? Now here's, uh, again, I'm quoting John Mark a lot in the sermon. I'm, I'm, I'm hyper-conscious of that. And I, uh, but 
at the end of the day, he's the guy smashing it right now in terms of discipleship, and I'm tired of trying to be cool and whatever. We're just going to follow the stuff that's actually working and just run with it. So if you want to go to a cool church, I'm sorry, we're just a lame, and, and today's just a whole lot of John Mark, which isn't whatever. It is what it is. I wish I was smarter because then it would be more Sam Harvey, but we're just going to roll with this. So John Mark points out, uh, a genuine wrestle of mine, by the way, whatever. Just I just can't be bothered. Oops. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. All right, we're right, we're all good. Okay, whatever. Just leave go find a cool church if you want to find a cool church. This is just loser church. Is um <laughs> here's the thing, right? So John Mark points out, and I just resonate with all the stuff, which is why I'm preaching it. Here's the stuff that's like, oh, here's how you change. Here's kind of like being the default kind of like and the first thing has been this. Uh the kind of thinking has been if if people just get into the Bible more, they'll change. Now, I know that's like, everyone's like, whoa, heresy incoming, man. Now, just obviously going to say this. I want you in this book. I so want you in this book. I read this book every single day. I read the, through the whole Bible every single year, and I say that as a humble brag. It's like, but I say that proudly, actually, because I had to fight for that habit because I'm not a, a structured type A guy. I'm loosey-goosey. I've fought for years, but now I've fought so hard because I want to be a man that, that lives a life orientated around this book. So I'm into this book. But here's the problem, and I've said this many times. We think information will bring transformation. It doesn't. And not only that, I've actually met some real, I can't use naughty words, I'm a pastor, real muppets, real, like just nasty people who know their Bible inside and out. I've no, like, I've, you know, Oh, I can't tell stories. <laughs> but, you know, I met some people where it's like, oh, you know your Bible really well, but you're just not that nice. And so information, there's a lot of mmms. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> I can't, I'm keen for a coffee with a couple of you guys after this one. Information is helpful, I say this all the time, because it brings revelation. So again, I want us to be in this book, but it, it's the application that brings the transformation, right? I've talked about that before. The problem is we are not just brains on legs, um, and James K. A. Smith said it like this, you can't think your way to Christ-likeness in the same way that listening to a podcast doesn't help you learn guitar or whatever. Let's, I love again what John Mark says here. Do, he says, do any, in his book, Be With, Become Like, Do What He Did, do any of you struggle with anxiety or fear? I do. I'm guessing that you, like me, know that Jesus commands you not to fear. <laughs> Your problem and mine isn't a lack of information or even a lack of inspiration. We all desire to be free of fear. It's the problem of how do you get what you already know and deeply desire into your central nervous system? How do you overcome habits of fear that are woven into your body's neurobiology? So like church attendance, good sermons, regular Bible study are massively, they're not just good, they're essential, okay? Absolutely essential. But we've got to be honest, by themselves, they've got a pretty poor track record of yielding a high level of transformation in large numbers of people. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing, I'm just going to annoy everyone this morning. So some people are a little triggered by that. Okay, next thing. Here go charismatics. The next thing is we think that we can just have a zap from the Holy Spirit and we're going to be transformed from glory to glory into the image of God. Which is like... It's like the Matrix thing, right? Where it's like just a download... And then I'm sorted. And like, oh man, I would love that if that was true. I'd be so keen. And the reason I think a lot of charismatics get frothed on this and chase spiritual high after spiritual high is actually a bit of laziness. It's actually easier to turn up to the altar call than it is to bring up the counsellor. And like, there have been so, there's so much brokenness in my life that I've just longed that God would just fix in a matrix download from the Holy Spirit moment. I would just love it. But, you know, and, and, and like I believe in the power of God to heal. Don't get me wrong. I am a card-carrying charismatic, shoulda under, coulda under, more Lord, please. I am all over it. I am so into the Holy Spirit. Not only that, this year I'm asking God for personally for a fresh encounter with God that I may experience the Holy Spirit's power even more. But here's the, here's the thing. Uh, this is again John Mark. This is how many people approach spiritual formation waiting for a download from heaven to radically change them in an instant. He says, at its best, this is a rightfully high view of the power of the Holy Spirit to deeply change us to encounter with Him. I'm longing for this myself. I want an encounter with God. I want to encounter His power. 
uh, to break strongholds over our lives, heal our memories, we rewire our nervous systems, touch our bodies. I'll go as far as to say any theory of change that doesn't incorporate the need for moments of breakthrough will only have limited results. But at its worst, this is laziness, pure and simple. Because as far as you go to church, I've just said this, go to church once a week chasing a spiritual high and an angle for a, angle for a download from heaven then to do the daily unglamorous work of discipleship. This approach can be just another search for a quick fix, a shortcut, what psychologist John Wellwood called spiritual bypassing, trying to skip over our pain and just have another Jesus fix or have Jesus just fix us, okay? So you've got the Bible, you've got the Holy Spirit. Now, those are important ingredients in the recipe, but I think we've just had churches that have doubled down on one or the other as a way of seeing people get changed. And the third thing is willpower, where it's like, I'm going to Tony Robbins my way into a good life, you know? I'm going to... Now, willpower is awesome, when it's there, I love, like man. When my willpower's with me, like I am, I'm running. I'm doing my devos. I'm not eating too many cheeseburgers. You know, it's awesome. The problem is that willpower is a depleting resource, and it's often that's why in the evening those cheese and crackers and that wine look so good. And you swore you weren't going to do that. And here we are once more having some cheese and crackers. Because willpower is a depleting resource. That's why it's easier to make good decisions in the morning and tougher to make them later at night. That's why as the year goes on, it's like we just struggle, right? Now, I don't know how many of you guys made New Year's resolutions, but we're not going to ask for a show of hands. The stats are simply too obvious. You know, it's as clear as that. It's a struggle streak when it comes to all that stuff. Um, Again, John Mark provides a helpful uh, balance here. This isn't to negate the role of self-effort. Self-effort uh, is key to spiritual formation. There's a synergistic, uh, oh man, these guys, eh? synergistic relationship between our spirits, our willpower, and God's spirit or power. Self-effort and grace are partners, not competitors locked in a tug of war for glory. But the main function of self-effort in our formation is to do what we can do, which is make space to surrender to God via the practices of Jesus so God can do what we can't do, heal, liberate, and transform us into people of love. So all those things are vital, Bible, Holy Spirit, willpower, but they are not enough. And I think, uh, therefore, because of this, many people, many of us are very jaded about a vision for living a different life that smells like Jesus. I just feel it when I'm preaching this stuff. I've been preaching this stuff for years now, at the start of every year, and to be honest, it's interesting sociologically what's going on. <laughs> Some of you guys that have really leaned in and really given it a good crack are like yes and amen. Like this just encourages you on something that you're already experiencing life in. But then there's a tribe of you who are just like discouraged and just maybe have given some stuff a little bit of a nudge, but then just, again, that path of leaf resistance has kicked in and all the rest of it. And you just are feeling pretty weary about another sermon that's a go team talk about following Jesus. And that's okay, grace and peace. Grace and peace. In fact, I think it's partly because of this, where we've had this kind of thing with the Christian faith around how do we become more like Jesus, where it's been like, I'm going to get inspired by a sermon or a conference or some moment, then I'm definitely going to try harder. I'm sick of being a rubbish Christian. We're definitely going to give it a good crack. Then you're going to struggle. Then you get super disillusioned. And then you've got guilt and shame. Yeah, it's the worst feeling in the world. And like, again, I've been there 100,000 times, okay? And you think it's tough doing that. Like, imagine that being a pastor, okay? Like, I'm meant to be a good Christian as a job. And it's like, okay, so not only that, I'm the worst pastor in the world. And oh my gosh, it's a nightmare. So I've been there 100,000 times where it's like, I want to be a better Christian for Jesus. And it's try hard to fail. Blah, blah, blah. But this is not the model, it's subtle shifts here, but this is not the model that Jesus gives us. And this is why what John Mark's been on about and what God is doing in the church in the West at the moment is so vital in terms of restoring the way of Jesus and discipleship back to the church. Because this is actually the model that Jesus wanted to give us. He gives us this beautiful, well, that was the cue. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We rehearsed it as well. No, we didn't actually. Um, is, is, I love this, C, practice. That word is so important, we get our heads and hearts around. I've said this a few times now, but it's like, if you want to learn an instrument, you're going to be rubbish when you start. If you want to run a marathon or a half marathon or whatever, you're not going to be running big Ks when you start. 
practice, a whole different mindset when it comes to discipleship. I'm going to practice this stuff, and it's going to be weird and lame at the start. Your Sabbaths are going to be actually like a weird day and sometimes exposing and a bit lame until you crack through into the glory that's there waiting for you. within it. Devo's the whole thing. And that releases a blessing over your life when you practice this stuff, and it slowly becomes like gets into your bones. It becomes habit. It becomes actually in your character. It moves from being a discipline to a desire, from a desire to actually being a delight because it releases something of God's life over you as you choose to follow the way of Jesus that leads to life. And then you just see some more stuff and you're like, oh, I want to be like that. Like, I'm going to ask for hands up. Who's read the How to Spend a Day with Jesus book that we handed out the last couple of days? Hands up nice and high. Okay, so about over half of you here, which is cool. So we're going to put, <laughs> we're going to, I think we don't have any more copies. So I'm going to put that on our private Facebook group if you want to read it. Now, the reason that we handed that out is, and I know that Matt read it, and had, he read it because I led a retreat day at St. Pat's on Wednesday for the teachers, and I handed it out to them, and then Matt read it for the first time as part of his personal development <laughs> for St. Patrick's School. Anyway, so, so Matt's all very smug until the pastor goes, no, I know exactly why you proudly put your hand up, Mr. Matt Dunn. Anyway. Um, but the reason that that book, that little booklet of 30 pages, so everyone's like, I can't really read, 30 pages anyone can read. The reason I hand it out is not like, it's just to give you a vision so you'd see something that causes something of an ache in your heart or activates your imagination that says, I want to live that day. And then you start, you're just like, you're not going to be frigging John Mark Comer. None of us will be, most of all, probably in our whole lifetime. He's a unicorn, right? Total freak, but he embodies the stuff to a whole other level because he should as an apostolic leader. Blah, blah. But, I'm a, but I want Sam Harvey's day with Jesus to get richer and more intentional and deeper. And so that fills my imagination. Then I start practicing it and I'm rubbish at it when I start. But I can tell you now after, after probably 10 plus years of devotion to discipleship that it gets easier and becomes more normal, and that just releases a blessing over your life. And then I'll see something else, and I'm like, oh, I want that. I want to live a bit more simply. That really, that looks like Jesus. And I've got to practice, and I'm rubbish it as I start. And on we go. Amen? There's a whole different way of looking at discipleship, and this is what Jesus is inviting us into. So here's what I want to say. Don't give up. Don't give up. Please, those of you discouraged and annoyed at yourself and, and going, here we start 2024 and I just feel pretty like I'm just exactly where I was. Don't give up. God is for you. Don't let the enemy just, just speak any lie over who you are. In terms of, again, trust me, this is why God's called me to this, lead this church because you guys didn't need some Taipei structured person leading your church. You needed a Muppet like me. You know, on Strengths Finder, you know, like, uh, you know, you do a little test and it tells you, you know, what you're good at. So, and it was very accurate for me in terms of the top five stuff I'm good at. Now, the idea is that you're leaning into those strengths. You know what was second to bottom? Consistency. <laughs> like, I am not. <laughs> I'm not that guy. And so that's why when Paul's saying, but that's fine. I'm not going to label myself as someone who's just going to be loosey-goosey my whole life because when I was a child, I acted like a child, but it's time I put the childhood ways behind me instead of maturing into some adulthood. And guess what? Even a guy with consistency as number 34 in his strength finder can read his Bible every day. If I can do it, you can do it. Trust me, it just takes practice. So do not give up. The life of love, joy, and peace is waiting for you on the other side of choosing to practice the way of Jesus. So let's move on to how we change. Again, John Mark's stuff, which is super helpful. I'm going to rip through this because actually you're going to do some homework in uh, church this morning. We're going to hand out some stuff and you're going to do some writing about your rule of life in a second. Um, I'm not going to unpack this in any depth, but how do we change? We get into the practices, practicing the way, PTW. We... And, we, we fill our lives with teaching. Again, this is about getting into the book, but it's not the only thing. It's coupled with a whole lot of other stuff, but we fill our minds with the story of God rather than the story of culture. We have an active spirituality. That's stuff you are in control of. Uh, I've said this in the past, but I've been in counselling almost every single year I've been in full-time ministry. I think in 2022 was a light year. Last year wasn't, okay? I was in like deep because there was stuff that got brought up and you can choose to run from it or you can choose to invite Jesus into it. Uh, and so that's tricky, but I can be in control of that. But then there's stuff, passive spirituality, there's stuff you are not in control of. So passive spirituality is like your age and stage. 
There's limitations on your life depending on the different uh, space of life that you're in. And all of those things are an invitation of God to, to grow and to be changed. Life and community, uh, to organize these goals of your life. And then over the, the lo- formation in the way of Jesus is way slower than we would like, annoyingly so. It doesn't happen overnight. So here's another way of looking at um, that Rachel Hunt has significantly shaped uh, our discipleship model. Next slide, uh, Doug. <laughs> oh, Josh, sorry. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So here's another way of, it's a more simple way of looking at this. With the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you, fill your life with the teaching of, like, be intentional about that, intentional about community, intentional about practice, and then over time and with suffering, yay! will be transformed into the image of God. So uh, let me just dive into some, some very practical ways of how, because here's the thing, this works, okay? But the issue isn't me, it's so easy to put a slide up on the screen in church, it's so difficult to live it. So it, needs, it requires super, like actual intention from you to be like, yeah, I want to be changed so that my life is orientated around Jesus. So you've got to work out what that looks like on the daily. So this is where the idea of a rule of life comes, comes from. Josh, next slide, please. Uh, nurturing a growing spirituality with depth in our present-day culture will require a thoughtful, conscious, intentional plan for our lives, says Pete Scazzero. Now, so this is where today we're going to lean into, in a second, I'm going to get you just engaging with this very pragmatically in terms of your days. Uh, this is what uh, historically in the church has been called this idea of a rule of life. Now, rule of life freaks out some people because we don't like the word rule. Now, that's because, again, English words change their time over time. This is not like rules. This is a rule that's meant to actually be like regular. It comes from the Latin word trellis. So this is meant to be a framework. So I'm going to hand out a sheet in a second that says rule of life. The first thing that you can do if you don't like that word is scratch it out. And instead put rhythms of intention. Okay, does that make more sense? Rhythms of intention. Or if you don't like that, just write hashtag life because this is your friggin' life day by day. And is it actually around, orientated around discipleship to Jesus or not? I'm not sure, right? Up to you. Because here's the thing, you already have a rule of life. You have things that you do on the daily. The question is, is it shaping you into a, a devoted disciple of Jesus experiencing love, joy, and peace or is it causing all sorts of other stuff? You already have a rule of life. The question is whether it's helpful or not in terms of the way of Jesus. So I'm saying so often we just swim in our life. At, from time to time, we've got to work on our life. So it's like I'm about to hit another week. And it's like rather than just go through my week, how about I take a step back from it and say, is this working to actually shape the way of Jesus in my life? And what do I need to tweak and change? Uh, so here's something of a backstory when it comes to these sorts of moments. In the Bible, you've got these moments where commitment or, the, or someone would consecrate themselves to the way of Jesus. So you'd have things like a Nazarene vow, a set of practices that you'd make to reflect your commitment to God. So uh, it looks like uh, the Apostle Paul did this in Acts chapter 18 and John the Baptist, as well as others throughout the Old Testament. And then the first uh, uh, couple of centuries of the church, um, like the church is like this radical counterculture. It's like... It's just frowned upon. It's all, and I talked a couple of sermons last week about you know like how hard it was to get into the church. Like you really had to be keen on Jesus to wind up in the church, right? You listen to that sermon if you haven't listened to it already. Um, but there's basically this time where the church um, by the year 300 had just so subversively taken over the Roman Empire that Constantine uh, was like. Politically, the smart thing to do is go, okay, let's make it the state religion because it's so subversively like, just spread throughout the Roman Empire. Massive. Um, and this is insane. In 300 years since Jesus died, this movement's gone from a fringe sect to now the state religion, which is really good on some levels. No more gladiatorial fighting, no more worship of the emperor. Um, and so, and it's interesting where it's like there's still a movement amongst Christians that desperately want the state to make Christianity the religion for the nation. But the problem is, historians conclude it was actually almost the death blow for the church. Because the church has always actually thrived on the margins. And when the church buddies up to power, it actually leads to spiritual powerlessness. 
it dilutes it, it waters it down. The church was no longer getting into the empire, the empire was actually getting into the church. So thankfully there were some people that saw the rot, that saw that just saw the unbelievable dilution and compromise that was starting to just happen in the church. And they were determined to recover the prophetic identity of the church. Hallelujah. And so St. Anthony started this movement of people, uh, people of prayer and the word, the desert mothers and fathers. And they would set up communities, outposts of God's kingdom. And within that community, they would form this agreement about how they were going to live so that the love of God would be at the center of their lives. And this was the beginning of a renewal movement in the church because of the commitment they made. And those movements are still impacting us today, their dedication to God. God. And this slowly morphed into the tool that we're going to be looking at in a second called the rule of life. Again, John Mark, he says, a rule was a schedule and a set of practices to order your life around the way of Jesus in community. It was a way to keep from getting sucked into the hurry, busyness, noise, and distraction of regular life. A way to slow down, a way to live into what really mattered, what Jesus called abiding. Don't let the language of rule put you off. And we're not John Mark, we're actually going to change it. It's called now rhythm of intention. The word rule comes from the Latin word regular, which means straight piece of wood, think ruler, but it was also used for trellis. What's underneath every thriving vine is a trellis, a structure to hold up the vine so it can bear fruit. Now, plants come to our house to die. So I'm just not going to, oh, that's a terrible, um, but we've got, uh, you know, uh, folks in our church involved in the vi- you know, vineyards around our place. And it's like, we, just, we live in a vineyard space where you're not seeing too many vines just growing on the ground, spreading out wherever. You see unbelievable structure around these things to help them grow healthily. And we need that same thing. A vine without structure will grow some fruit, but man, it is incredible. It's missing its potential dramatically. A well-tended vine with a great trellis of support will be a much fruit. So a rule of life is, is a way for us to take Matthew 11 seriously. I'm going to take my yoke upon you, Jesus. I'm going, to, I'm going to be yoked to you, Jesus. I want to be bound to you. I want to walk with you, Jesus. Um, and this leads to rest to our souls. And, a, and what we're about to do, and I want you to be reflecting on this stuff, a rule of life, like organizing your life around Jesus is actually more about subtraction than it is addition. It's more about saying no to things and slowing down than adding stuff to an already over full plate. That takes courage. That's why we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to disappoint people so that we can say no to all those things so that we can say a bigger yes to Jesus. We achieve uh, inner peace when our schedule aligns with our values, says Stephen Covey. So uh, let's really, I'm going to skim through some stuff. Next slide, Josh. Um, Next slide after that. so you already have a rule of life, that's cool. All right, that's a great picture, by the way. Someone should, should stick that in my poster or whatever. Okay, that's, that is awesome. All right, next. next. Well, the idea of a rule of life, interestingly, like uh, every significant move of renewal in the church has, has involved a rule of life. I'll repeat that. Every significant move of God in the church has had at its centre an agreement to a rule of life. That's huge. Uh, in the 5th century, uh, you've got St. Benedict, you don't have that there, they have their rule of life. Count Zinzendorf, the best, best name in the whole friggin' world, uh, founder of the Moravian movement, started the global missions movement, is the reason 24-7 prayer is happening, birthed countless moves of God around the world. They had this honourable order of the mustard seed rule of life that held it together. Blair's in the middle of, of signing up to that, uh, honor, uh, to that order of the mustard seed right now. John Wesley, dramatic move of God led by uh, the Wesleyan movement, held together by Wesley's whole Holy Club. Guess what? Wesley had an upper click that was central to the move of God. They had weekly meetings where they asked each other questions about how their discipleship was going. And I've read this book called Marks of the Movement. Fascinating. The second they stopped doing that, the renewal movement just plummeted into free fall. And I'm like, if they needed accountability, how much more do we do we in the cultural pressures that we swim under? Charles Finney, leader of the Great Awakening in America, had this going on in his final sermon called The Christian's Rule of Life. His final sermon, he says this, to live what we are living right now into maturity, to age this new wine into a fine vintage, we are going to need a vow of commitment. Mother Teresa ordered her personal life in their community around a humility list. Billy Graham shared a rule of life called the Modesto Manifesto. Like there is, this is not 
peripheral to the church. This has actually been central to the church, a commitment to live the way of Jesus together. These guys stewarded renewal movements in the church and holding it together was a communal commitment to a a way of life. So, Karen, now's your time to shine. We're going to hand out uh, a pamphlet. We handed this out last year. We also have extra pens over information. And today we're just going to begin uh, to uh, explore what it looks like to have a rule of life. So this is a page that you can fill in. You can fill in uh, a bit of it today. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Josh. Um, so here's some of the stuff that's going to be on uh, this page. and it's And again, the question is, How can you live with the love of God at the center of your life? The question is, how can you uh, uh, arrange your ordinary days and weeks to reflect the devotion to Jesus? And so the question is, there's four key things here. Life with God, or what it looks like to be with Jesus. What are the spiritual disciplines that you need to anchor your life in God in this season? Uh, We're going to talk next week about the, the power of communities because uh, community is absolutely key within that, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, But particularly with your devotional practices, what does it look like to to incorporate prayer, Sunday service, silence, scripture? Um, I do Bible in a year, not because I think every Christian should do it, because I'm so disorganized. If I don't have some sort of structure, I'm not going to read my Bible. I just need something. So for unorganized people like me, you'll maybe need something like that. For people that are a lot more together, you could be like, you know what, I'm going to work through, you know, whatever. Can I suggest with the Bible engagement that if reading the Bible is something new to you or you're not very consistent at it, don't start in Genesis. Please, for the love of all that is holy, can you not start there because you will get partway through. And here's what we're trying to do, friends. We're trying to orientate our life around Jesus. So the best thing that you can do is read the Gospels over and over and over and over again. If you're going to read anything in the Bible, read the Gospels. Uh, Secondly, uh, what does it look like to to take rest seriously? What are the practices of self-care that you need to care for your body and nurture your soul? Uh, That may include things like counselling, to, to look up, and, and again, that's been something that's been a large part of my journey, uh, taking Sabbath seriously. Uh, and I just love that Jesus is like, come to me and rest. <laughs> learn of me. So it's like, you've got to learn to rest. Anyone in our church, and there's a whole lot of you that have tried Sabbath and it sucked, it's because you're not good at it. <laughs> so you've got to practice it because resting well takes practice. And you've got to embrace the reality of your season. With little children, it's very different than when I was single. But there was a way for me to learn to rest well. And the more I rested well, the easier it was to love well. Like how much easier is it to be nice to people when you're rested? <laughs> Amen? And there's again on that Be With Jesus book, the How to Spend the Day of Jesus book, it's like sleep's actually a spiritual discipline. So maybe part of your like, how do I look after myself is like, I'm going to go to bed at this time. You set a bedtime. At least it was too loud. Uh, relationships. Um, <laughs> What uh, core relationships do you need in the season of life to support you in your journey? We're going to unpack that a whole lot uh, next week. But here's the thing that I want to say is that I think any working model of spiritual formation will actually bear some sort of resemblance to Alcoholics Anonymous. I actually think we need that level of accountability uh, when it comes to our spiritual formation because it has these beautiful three elements, a radical self-awareness, honesty, and confession. I love our upper clip crew so much and I love my huddles so much because no Pharisees are allowed in my upper clicks or my huddles. I am tired of seeing people that are whitewashed tombs presenting well when there's a whole lot of death and decay on the inside. So how about we just got radically honest like the alcoholics do about actually how bad our devos are. Just throwing it out there. So that, the, the AA have that. Secondly, they have a total to surrender to God's power and a dependence on Him. And they have a loving, tight-knit of community to love you and hold you accountable to becoming 
to, to walk into your true self. And you take away any one of those three elements and the, and the proverbial still falls over. We need all three, radical self-awareness, total surrender to God, and a loving, tight-knit community around us. So who are those people? We're going to hit this in a whole sermon next week because community is central, and we're going to reboot huddles, and we're going to get our pom-poms out for home churches, and we're going to encourage you to engage with the upper clicks. Again, I'm just saying, after years pastoring here at Bay Vineyard, the people that engage with those communities grow. People that don't struggle or plateau very quickly. So who are the, but also it's like, it's really good to hang out with your mates. It's fun. Kicking the ball around on a Wednesday night with the soccer crew is a spiritual thing. Good for the soul. Blah, blah, blah. Isn't that lovely? Relationships. And then lastly, mission. What are the gifts and passions uh, and burdens that, within you that God wants you to express for the blessing of others? And so uh, this is an invitation to live uh, the vision of uh, of following Jesus, not just have a vision of following Jesus. And so I'm going to work on this myself. In fact, Caroline, I'm going to need a copy of that um, because uh, there's some things that have changed for me this year. But as but there's something powerful about putting pen to paper. And can I just grab that, Luke? Um, on the back here, like, oh, there's two here. Thank you. One's Terry's. I'll fill you one in, Terry. Um, so... But I'm literally writing like times down, you know, like Monday, when, when's the devos happening? And like, you know, Monday for me is a day where I can have a slightly longer devotional time, which is just a lovely, you know, time of refreshing out of a big Sunday for me. Um, Wednesday's a fasting day for me, contending day. Um, it's not my funnest day of the week, and it's right in the middle, so whatever, let's just make it really tough. But I'm like, there's something about embodied contention for more of God that I love when it comes to the fasting practice. Friday for me is Sabbath. Sunday for most of you will be Sabbath. And, and I, man, oh, I've got a whole... If, you, if you're not frothed on Sabbath, go just engage with the Practicing the Way stuff or engage with our home church stuff. But I'm like, literally like writing out what is the most replenishing, refreshing day that you can have filled with treats... Pleasure stacking to the nines. It's a day of feasting. Like, what does that look like in communion with God? Again, just like, I just, isn't this awesome? Like, Sabbath was punishable by death in the Old Testament. It's a big deal to God, right? It's in the Ten Commandments. But it's the equivalent of saying, eat the lollies, this will kill you. It's like, okay, you know? It's like, but why do so much of us struggle to engage with the beautiful holy day of rest? It's because we're deeply broken. And we think our worth connected to how many bricks we're making like stuck in Pharaoh's world, and Jesus set us free to be people that could worship him and could rest well. Hallelujah. So anyway, so it's like, what are, what are those things that you want to lean into, those relationships? So get the paper out, get the pen out, get the diaries out, and actually work on your life rather than just live in your life. And this for me, every year I start this, every year I start this, and it's like there's some changes that need to be made, and every year that those changes are made, I have to disappoint some people because I'm changing what I'm doing. Because ultimately I want to be more obedient to God than I do over the demands of all the people around me. God's often, I just he's challenged me so many times, Sam, you're making sandwiches in the kitchen I didn't ask you to make. Come and sit at my feet. How many of us are running life, we were in, this, in the kitchen making sandwiches he didn't ask us to make. And he's inviting us to sit at his feet and to enjoy him. You're going to have to disappoint some people. Some people aren't getting their sandwiches because you're choosing to serve the feet of Jesus. You know what I mean? So it's like, what are you saying no to? How can you? Don't be a victim, is all I'm trying to say on this whole thing. Don't be a victim that says, I don't have control of my life. Yes, you do. You can. Let's organize our life around Jesus and find the life that's found in Him. Amen? Okay, so you've got, we're going to pray for some people. You've got 10 minutes. Um, Josh, we'll put on some mellow thinking music. Like, just really, you got to pick something that feels rule of lifey, that feels rhythms of intentiony. Uh, you know, so no pressure, man. Can't be too upbeat, you know. But at the same time, you can't put us to sleep. We've had a big morning, so you know, it's all on you, bro. Uh, and so, uh, and just sit with Jesus and wrestle with the stuff. Like, what is it? Now, if you don't have a pen, in a second, I'm going to ask you to put up your hand, and Karen and me and a few others are going to run round and um, and give you some pens. Um, but I'm serious, let's just put some pen to paper now about what this year could look like with Jesus because how you spend your days is how you spend your life.